Now that we have a basic introduction to rotational motion and how we describe it and quantify it, we've looked at a little bit of gravity and satellite motion, uh, we're going to talk about what actually gets something so that it is rotating. Namely, what makes something spin, and the answer is going to be a torque. Uh, we'll talk also a little bit about rotational equilibrium. These are very similar to the types of problems we did back in Unit 2 where we did free body diagrams and we found missing forces. Um, we can do something very similar except now we'll find missing torques or forces, but we have more information. So uh, it's building upon what we learned, but some new stuff too. So first of all, what is a force versus what is a torque? Remember, you need a force to cause a change in motion. Um, so if the sum of the forces is zero, you have what we call static equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium. In other words, a body is at rest, remaining at rest. A body in motion remains in motion. But if you do apply a force, you're going to get a mass times acceleration. You're going to get some change of motion if you have a net force. Torque is very similar. In order to cause a change in rotation, so a change in that angular velocity, then you have to apply a torque. Um, if you want something to be uh, rotationally stable or in a rotational equilibrium, in other words, something is, is sitting there but it's not spinning, then you have to have the sum of the torques is equal to zero. Um, and the same kind of laws apply when you're talking about rotational motion. If a body is rotating, it will keep rotating. And if a body is not rotating, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay that way. It won't be rotating anymore. Okay. So let's define a force. A torque, I'm sorry, is to force as, uh, defined as a force times a lever arm. Um, and a lever arm is the perpendicular distance between an applied force and its axis of rotation. So mathematically speaking, we have Fd sine theta. That's the formula that we're going to use. So let's take a couple little examples. So I'm, I'm drawing a little picture of a door. If you want to open the door, the door has little hinges on it. And so you push, let's assume the door isn't clicked in a locked position. You push the door, and the door is going to rotate. Okay? So we say that it has an axis of rotation. Um, it's also important to notice that where we push the door, so typically you're going to push the door, pull the door, out at the very edge of the door where that little knob is. The distance from where you apply the force and the axis of rotation, or the hinge, is called the lever arm. So it's a force and a distance that we care about. And when we push that, then we can get something rotating. Here's another example. If you have your wrench and you have a little nut and you want to rotate it or a bolt and you want to screw it down, you apply a force down here at the end on the, on the wrench and then uh, that force is applied a distance away from the nut, which is over here. Um, and by having a force and a distance, and, and notice in this case that the force is actually perpendicular to the lever arm, um, by applying that force, you can get that nut to rotate. A lot of tools that we build uh, out in our workshops, are they're designed to increase the amount of torque. Okay, it's the ability to rotate something. So a force times a lever arm is going to give you that ability. And finally, the example is a spool. So if you have a spool or a cylinder... Um, with some, you know, cable wrapped around it. This is another example where you can get this spool to start spinning. And so I'm going to give you, this is like a, a you know, um, orthogonal view, but if you want to look at um, a side cutout, what you have here is a force that you're pulling down on the string or the thread or the cable or whatever it is. Um, you apply that force, and as you pull down, the lever arm uh, in other words, the distance from the force to the axis of rotation, which is the center of the spool, that's that little distance d, that's actually the radius of the spool. So that becomes really useful if you want to solve those kinds of problems. One thing that's really cool about a spool and, um, and a thread is if you have a spool wrapped around and you pull the thread out, it's always, always, always going to come out at a right angle. So that's really convenient. We don't have to worry about any angles when we're dealing with spools. Okay, so... Uh, torque is defined as force times the lever arm. And what we care about is the, if the, is the component of force that is actually perpendicular to the lever arm. So here's the force, but all I care about is that perpendicular component of the force. Remember when we did work? Work, all we cared about was the parallel component to um, the distance it was moving. This time we care about the perpendicular. So this time we're talking about the sine theta as opposed to the cosine theta before. So torque is F times
times d, and the d in this case is going to be this distance from where you apply the force to the axis of rotation times the sine of the angle between the force and that lever arm. So uh, other kind of conventions, we say if you turn something counterclockwise, oh, and that's good, okay, so I'm gonna keep come, I'll come back to that. Uh, oh, so, so I'm looking here at these two little wrenches, sorry. The big wrench has a great big lever arm, so if you apply a small force with a great big lever arm, you're gonna get a good sized torque, okay? That's what's ha happening down here. And then with this other smaller wrench where you have a littler lever arm, you could apply the same force and you're gonna get less torque. So, it's in your interest, if you really want to get something to turn, to have a great big lever arm, because then you don't have to apply as much force. Um, okay, so back to the positive, uh, negative, wait, sorry, positive, negative. Positive, so if you want to have something like this, this wrench, in this case, is going to have it spin around this way, uh, that would be considered a positive torque. Anyway, anything that spins something in the counterclockwise direction is going to be positive, anything that goes in the clockwise direction is going to be negative. That's just the standard that we've set. Okay, so concept question. To exert the maximum torque with a wrench, the angle in degrees between the force and the angle should be what? Well, sine theta, right? That FD sine theta. You want to get the perpendicular component of the force to the lever arm. So basically you want it to be perpendicular, which means that 90 degrees is going to be your is going to be your maximum torque. Um, and think of that, sine of 90 is 1. So it basically, the torque just becomes F times D if you don't have to worry about the sine of theta or sine of 90 degrees. So that's the maximum torque you're going to get for any force. Okay. Equilibrium. So let's go back to when we were doing statics problems. We said we had a problem situation where we had the sum of the forces is equal to 0. And we created free body diagrams, and we tried to find all the forces that were acting. And this is pretty challenging, especially when we got looking at ramp problems and stuff. But we said, what are all the forces in the x direction? Set those equal to zero. What are all the forces in the y direction? Set those equal to zero, and then you could solve for any missing values. We're going to do something very similar now called a rotational equilibrium problems. In this case, the sum of the torques is also equal to zero. So we have one more equation. We're still going to use these guys. They're still really helpful, but we're going to add one more, which is that the sum of the torques has got to be equal to zero, too. Um, and then we can find more missing quantities. So as I give some example problems, you'll see what I mean. Here's an example of a, just a typical, uh, on your left, is an example of a typical um, free body diagram for a statics problem. You have an mg force down. You have forces at an angle. You can find what the total uh, tension force is, something like that. And then this one down over here, this is a rotational problem where you could sum up all the forces acting. This is a, a balance beam. Um, and then you could figure out, all right, well, so what are these distances, for example? What is the distance here and what is the distance here given these masses such that this thing doesn't rotate, that is balanced, like a teeter-totter that doesn't tip over? Uh, so that's the kind of problem we're going to be solving. In each case, the sum of the forces is equal to zero and the sum of the torques is equal to zero. So when we're dealing with equilibrium problems, you're not going to have any rotation or any translation. So uh, you drive, start by drawing a free body diagram. You know, sketch out all of the forces that are acting. Indicate all the forces on your diagram. Um, then choose an axis for a sum of your torque calculation. And typically when we're looking for an axis of rotation for a torque problem, you figure out where, where is it actually going to spin around. So if it's a hinged or if it's pinned or wherever it's going to rotate around, that's usually the axis that we choose. Um, and then we have three equations to find any unknowns that we need. So we have the sum of the forces in the x, sum of the forces in the y, and sum of the torques equals zero. You might not need all three, but you're probably going to need two. Okay, so here is a uh, first practice problem. Let's just do a simple torque problem. Okay, it says a 50 newton force is applied to a two, meet two meter, uh, is applied two meters from the hinge end of a bar. The force makes a 40 degree angle with the bar. Find the torque due to this force about the hinge. Okay, so this one's a little confusing until you've drawn a little sketch, and then it's pretty straightforward. So here we go. I've got a bar, and I'm going to apply a 50 newton force, and I'm going to apply that two meters away from the hinge end of the bar. So the hinge end of the bar is over here. So it's going to spin around that, okay? Uh, so the question is, if I apply that force, 
then um, what is the torque going to be around that bar? So uh, remember, torque is Fd sine theta. Um, so let's figure out what we know and plug it in. So in this case, our torque is going to be 50 newtons times the lever arm, that distance to where the force is applied from the center of rotation, which is 2 meters, times the sine of 40 degrees. Now, if you get confused and you think, oh, is it the sine of 40 degrees? Or maybe it's this angle over here. Is it the sine of, um, of 140 degrees? Because that's the, the supplement of that, right? Well, if you remember your signs, you're going to get the same value either way. So you, don't, you can't make a mistake. Just figure out the angle between the force and um, the lever arm and plug it in. You're good to go. So the torque in this case is 64 newton meters. Notice the units. Okay, We have force times distance, so we get newton meters. This is very similar to when we did work, which is a force times a distance, but in that case, there was an energy relationship, so when we talked about a newton meter, we used a joule. Now, torque isn't an energy thing. It's just a rotational thing, so it's a, it's a newton meter. So we just leave it, torque, in, in units of newton meters. Even though you could call them joules, it just seems weird because torque isn't about energy. Okay. Next problem, 2 kilograms, 0.6 meter long horizontal bar is hinged at one end. A vertical rope is attached to the other end. Find the tensions of the bars at rest. Find the vertical force the hinge exerts on the bar. So this is a classic, sort of typical equilibrium problem. Again, uh, don't panic when you see one of these. Just start sketching and draw a diagram of what is going on. So here we go. I have my uh, two, kilo, 2 kilogram, 0.6 meter long horizontal bar. Um, so I've indicated the length of the bar. And then I put uh, a vertical rope on one end. It says find the tension so that the bar is at rest. Find the vertical force the hinge exerts on the bar. So we're saying that the hinge is over on this side, and that rope is ho holding this bar nice and steady. So we have an equilibrium situation. It's not rotating. It's not moving. The sum of the forces is zero. The sum of the torques is zero. So let's start by drawing a free body diagram and indicate all of the forces acting. So if you can imagine, you're going to have a tension force on the right side. Okay, so that string is pulling it up. That you know. And then you're going to have some sort of force on the hinge um, where it's rotating. Now that force might be up and it might be down. I don't really know what it is, but I'm just going to say it's up, and then when we solve, we'll figure it out, because either the answer will be positive or negative. And if it's negative, then I was wrong. It's actually a downward force. But there is one more force acting here, and that is, and you know that because if you cut the rope, right, this thing would, would spin. It would drop. It would go, woo! It would be sliding down like that. But it doesn't because of the rope. So what is that extra force? That extra force is the, the mg force of, of that um, bar itself. Um, now, when you want to solve rotation problems, um, you have to assume that all of the mass of the bar is actually located at its center of mass. And you can look at something symmetric like a long bar, and you can just put all of the weight, that mg force, right smack in the middle and assume that all of the force is acting there and it's not acting anywhere else. And basically, if you're, you're doing an integral and averaging it, um, so it works out really well. Um, so just go with the symmetry here. So you have the gravity force pulling it down, and that gravity force acts halfway along. And if that's halfway along, then you know that that's going to be about 0.3 meters over. Okay, so here we go. Some of the forces in the y direction. We want to have an equation, all the forces in the y direction. We have the hinge forces up minus the gravitational force down plus the tension force that's up, and that's got to equal zero. So we could solve for the hinge force, and the hinge force is going to be the opposite of the tension force plus the gravity force. Um, so that's good. So if we can get that tension force, we can get the gravity force, then awesome, we've got the, the force on the hinge, which is what we're supposed to find. Okay, But that's not enough for us to do it. We're looking at this, there aren't any forces in the x direction, so I don't even have to worry about that equation. But I can worry about my torque equation. So when you say the torque equation, we're going to say the sum of the torques around some axis has got to be zero. And it's just typical that we'll say, what's the sum of the forces around the, the hinge itself? Well, now, when you're going to figure out the torques around the hinge, remember the hinge, that F of H, it has no lever arm. Okay, so we're going to do torques, remember, is F D sine theta. And so there's an F, that's the force of the hinge, but there's no D. There's no distance from the hinge. So that term goes to zero, which is really convenient. Now we're going to figure out the force, the torque due to the mg force. And so it's going to be mg, that's the gravitational force, times the distance, or the lever arm, which in this case is going to be 0.3 meters. 
okay, plus the tension force times 0 0.6 meters. Okay, so now let's look at that again. This equation represents all of the torques combined. Okay, so the sum of the torques is equal to zero. This is the torque due to the hinge, which is zero since there's no lever arm. This is the torque due to the gravitational force, which tends to rotate it in a counterclockwise direction. Ah, in a counter, I'm sorry, in a clockwise direction. Because this force, the F, the FG force, tends to rotate in a counterclock, I'm sorry, in a clockwise direction, I'm making it negative. That's kind of this convention we discussed. So if something rotates it in a clockwise direction, it's considered negative, and counterclockwise is positive. So I say minus mg times the lever arm, 0.3 meters. And then the last one is the torque due to the rope. And that torque is the force Fd times the lever arm, 0.6 meters. Notice I didn't include any sine thetas here. I didn't have to. The reason I didn't have to is because they're all at right angles. And so in every case, sine theta is just 1. So this is a little bit simpler from that respect. Not that torque problems are at all simple. Okay, now I have enough information. I know the mass. I know what gravity is. Um, the, this, this whole term cancels out, and so I, I can now solve for that tension force right here. That's what I'm looking for, okay? So I solve algebraically, and I'm going to find that Ft is equal to 9.8 newtons. And so now I can take that value, and I can take that and put it in, plug it in over here at this equation, and I can solve for that hinge force. So I get the hinge force is negative 9.8 newtons plus 2 kilograms times 9.8, which is a total of 9.8 newtons. So the force in the hinge is also 9.8 newtons. All right, that's tricky. There's no question about it. We're going to do a bunch of these so that we get good at them. All right, a horizontal meter stick is balanced on a fulcrum at the center. If a 6 kilogram block is hung on the stick 20 centimeters from the fulcrum, how far should a 4 kilogram block from the fulcrum so that the meter stick remains horizontal? This is a teeter-totter problem or a balance beam problem. So let me sketch it out for you, okay? I guess that went a little bit too fast. Let me back it up so you can just see this part, okay? So here's what you have. A horizontal meter stick is balanced on a fulcrum. So this, this is your fulcrum right here, okay? That's where it's balanced. Um, and then you put a 6 kilogram block 20 centimeters away, and the question is where are you going to put the 4 kilogram so that this thing will be balanced? And you have a sense, right, because you've ever been on a teeter-totter, you know that if you have less mass, then you're going to have to be further away from the center than the, 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 the mass on the side of it that it has more mass. But how much further do you have to be? Okay, so here's how we do it. We create a free body diagram. First of all, all the forces acting on that teeter-totter. We're going to have the force at the fulcrum. Let me slow it down. We have the force at the fulcrum right here pushing up, okay, pushing up on the, on the um, beam. And then you're going to have the gravity force pulling down from the 6 and the gravity force pulling up. I'm sorry, pulling down from the 4. So both those gravity forces, okay. And we know the 20 centimeter, but we don't know the other one. So how do we do this equation? Well... We can say that sum of the torques is equal to zero. I don't even have to do a force equation for this one, so I'm going to set it up. Okay, so what do we have? The first torque is you have the 6 kilogram, and that's going to be 6 kilogram times g. That's, this is the F of g, okay? That's the force of gravity, and that's going to be times 20 centimeters, okay? Now, I made this one negative. Why? Because it's going to rotate it this way, and that is clockwise, which is a negative torque. Okay, so that's the torque due to the 6 kilogram. Now let's include the torque due to the, due to the 4 kilogram. So that's going to be 4 kilogram times 9.8. That's the mg force times this distance, x. Okay, notice that one is positive because that one tends to rotate like this guy. If he were all acting by himself, would cause it to rotate this way, which is counterclockwise, which is positive. That's why this value is positive. Okay. So let's keep going. We'll solve the algebra. 4 kilogram times 9.8 times x is equal to 6 kilogram. I just took this term and moved it over to the other side. And look what I get. I have like a little proportion problem as it turns out. 4 kilogram times 9.8 times x equals 6 kilogram times 9.8 times 20. So it's like a balance problem. That's exactly what it is. I solve for x and I get 120 
over 4, which is 30 centimeters. Now, if you look at that kind of closely, um, now that I've labeled it, can you see that the product of these two, 6 times 20, gives you 120? It's going to be equal to the product of this times this, 4 times 30. That's also equal to 120. So the total torque, which is essentially this value going this way, is going to be equal to the torque going that way, equal and opposite. Put them opposite sides of the equation, they set them equal, you can solve. So a lot of times if you have balance beam problems, you can just look at them as little proportion problems. In this case, we do not have a balance. We're going to talk about this scenario in our next lesson. This is my daughter, and this is my son when he was about 12. So he wasn't going anywhere, so she just kind of hung him up there to dry. All right, till next time.